Welcome to LG Path Lab Pathology Webinar Series. Thank you so much, Dr. Limsi Gupta, for inviting me to do this webinar. My topic for today is myelodysplastic syndrome, and I'm basically focusing on morphological diagnostic approach. And then at the end, I will be discussing a few of the cases. My name is Dr. Babita Kajal. I'm a consultant pathologist and hematopathologist at Joseph Brand Hospital, Burlington, Ontario, in Canada. These are my objectives, definition, classification, morphological approach, and then few cases at the end. For the definition part, MDS is a bone marrow failure syndrome, especially a heterogeneous group of stem cell disorder, which is characterized by clinically we see different type of cytopenias. Morphologically, there are dysplastic changes in the hematopoietic cells, and depending upon the lineages, there can be single type of lineage dysplasia or multiple lineages they are involved. And then in the bone marrow, we see ineffective hematopoiesis. For the etiology part, majority of the cases they are required and age is one of the major risk factor because with increasing age, there will be increasing exposure to the mutagens and environmental toxins. Some other acquired causes, for example, paroxysmal nocturnal hematuria and aplastic anemia that can cause MDS. Primary causes, they are rare compared to the acquired one. And these include some chromosomal anomalies, for example, Down syndrome, trisomy 8, monosomy 7, some congenital neutropenia syndromes, and some DNA repair defects, and some constitutional genetic syndromes. So these, they can cause MDS. There are some changes from 2008 to 2016 WHO classification of MDS. In 2008, we used the word refractory and then modifier. And that word is now replaced with MDS and then we use the modifier. So for example, now if there is a single lineal dysplasia, then we say MDS with single lineal dysplasia. If there are multiple lineages they are involved, then obviously it's a multilineal dysplasia. So in between, they can have MDS with the ring citroblast. And again, depending on the lineages involved, they can have single lineage or multi-lineage dysplasia. So next category is with the excess blast. So depending on the number of blasts in peripheral blood film and in the bone marrow, we categorize them into two categories. First, E1 and EB2. And then this one is MDS with isolated lesion 5Q. And if we cannot apply any of the above categories, then we say it's unclassifiable. So this is MDSU. And then there is a refractory cytopenia of childhood, which is a provisional category in WHO classification. So this is a long list of uh, different uh, classifications. Based upon, first of all, we need to look at how many lineages they are involved. So if there is a single lineal dysplasia, so these patients, they will have obviously single lineage dysplasia and they can have one or two different types of cytopenias. And in the bone marrow, we see less than 5% or less than 15% of the ring citroblast. And bone marrow and peripheral blast, they are less than 5%. And peripheral blast, they are actually less than 1%. And these patients, they don't have any errors. And for the cytogenetics, they can be normal or abnormal. And if there are multiple lineages, they are involved. So obviously, this is called multilineal dysplasia. So they can have dysplasia in two or three different lineages, and the rest of the things they are still the same. Next things we need to look for is the ring pass in the bone marrow aspirate. So now they have more than 15% or more than 5%. So if this mutation is known as F3B1 then we need only 5%, but if this mutation is not done or not known, then we still need more than 15% of the ring citroblast to have this category. So next thing we look for is a single lineage or multilineal dysplasia. And these patients, they still have bone marrow blast less than 5%, and they are without any autots. This MDS with isolated lesion 5Q, which is a good prognostic category. These patients, they can have dysplasia in one to three lineages, and they can have one or two different types of cytopenias. And again, bone marrow blast, they are less than 5% without any r rod. So this abnormality that can be isolated one, only duration 5Q alone, or it can have one more additional anomaly, but without any deletion 7Q. 
Next category is with the excess blast. So based upon the number of blasts in the peripheral blood film and in the bone marrow, we have two categories, EB1 and EB2. So in EB1, bone marrow blasts, they are less than 9%. And in the peripheral blood film blasts, they are less than 5%. And we don't have any odd rod in this category. For two, now we have blasts up to 19% in bone marrow as well as in the blood. And they will have odd rods. And then next one is MDSU. These patients, they have 1% blood blast. Again, depending upon the lineages, they can have one or three lineages involved, one or two different type of cytopenias, and they have bone marrow blast less than 5%. In the peripheral blood film, when we are counting the blast, it should be documented on two separate occasions because one person blast, they are not reproducible. So that's why we need to have two separate occasions with one person blast. And they can, next category is MDSU with single lineal dysplasia and with pancytopenia. Again, bone marrow blast, they are still less than 5%. So then we can define MDS with any defining cytogenetic abnormalities. And uh, this one is cytopenia of the childhood, which is a provisional category in WHO classification. This is a long table of complex cytogenetic molecular abnormalities. Actually, none of these are specific to the MDS because these abnormalities we can see in other uh, MPN and MDS cases as well. So this one is SF3B1. If we see this one, then we need only 5%. And if we don't have this one, then we still need 15% of our incidental pass for the classification. And depending upon the cytogenetic abnormalities, these patients, they can have different uh, outcomes for the acute myeloid transformation. So based upon the category and classification, we classify them into three categories. One is low risk, intermediate, and high risk. So low risk patients, obviously they have single lineage involved and MDS with the isolated lesion 5Q, this is also under the category of good prognosis. Intermediate patients, they have multilineal dysplasia and high risk categories, obviously with the excess blast, and they have higher risk of transformation to acute myeloid leukemia. So how do we actually approach the case? So for any um, neurological cases, we need to have clinical history. We need to have symptoms, duration of the symptoms, and for Along with that, we need complete blood parameters, especially cytopenias, and how many lineages are involved, how many different type of cytopenias, is it like a single cytopenia or pancytopenia? Along with that, for uh, morphological dysplasia, we need to have well-prepared and well-stained slides. So this is one of the crucial factors for the diagnosis of MDS, because dysplasia, identification, we need to have actually very well-stained slides because dysplasia is a very objective term and there is a lot of inter-observer variability. So that's why we need to have uh, very nice slides. So other important thing is when we are evaluating the bone marrow and uh, other things, we need to evaluate in parallel. So peripheral blood film, bone marrow respirate, touch preps, bone marrow biopsies, they should be evaluated in parallel. And for a good core, we need to have at least 15 millimeter, 1.5 centimeter uh, of the length. That's the optimal length for the uh, core. And uh, minimum, we need five peripheral blood film and bone marrow slides for uh, dysplasia identification. So clinically, MDS is a disease of elderly. So more than 65 years of the age patients, they get MDS. And depending upon clinical features, these patients, they can have unexplained cytopenias, pancytopenias. And again, based upon lineages, they can have anemia, they can have infection, bleeding, bruising. And these patients, ultimately, they are at the risk of developing acute myeloid leukemia. And clinical outcome is actually based upon the classification and other cytogenetics and abnormalities and other comorbidities. Incidence of MDS is approximately 75 cases per 10,000 population. 
So what are the minimal diagnostic criteria we need to have for the diagnosis of MDS? So two most crucial things are cytopenia and dysplasia. So what actually is cytopenia? How do we define cytopenia? So when we say cytopenia, so that means hemoglobin is less than 10 gram per deciliter. Platelet count is less than 100. Absolute neutrophil count is less than 1.8. And peripheral monocytes, they are less than one. And for the dysplasia, we need to look for dysplasia in more than 10% of the cells. And then the next thing we need to look for the blast, more than five, but less than 19. And we are looking at the karyotype, abnormal or normal. And the most important point is clonality. Is this cytopenia and dysplasia, is that clonal one? Because there are so many different secondary causes. They can cause cytopenia as well as dysplasia. This list is not exclusive, but this is one of the secondary causes. They can cause cytopenia and dysplasia. So for example, vitamin B12 deficiency, citroblastic anemias, some chronic infections, chronic alcohol abuse, copper deficiency, autoimmune causes, and some congenital syndromes. They can cause cytopenia along with dysplasia. And other most important point is MDS can be borderline, sometimes borderline cytopenia and borderline dysplasia that can be seen in normal patients, but they are not clonal and they are not MDS. So we need to be careful about that. And other things we need for the diagnosis is, do we need to have cytogenetic abnormalities? Yes, we do. For the flow cytometry, is that specific for the MDS diagnosis? No, it's not. That is a very good supportive clue, and especially for the blast count. And there is one scoring system that is known as OHATA scoring system. For the mutations, as I mentioned earlier, there are not any specific mutations for the diagnosis of MDS. Again, it's a very supportive clue only. And again, depending on the type of mutations and cytogenetic abnormalities, prognosis can be different for different patients. There are some challenges in the diagnosis of dysplasia because dysplasia is a very objective term and it's not reproducible always, especially even among the uh, expert hematopathologists, it might not be reproducible. And other thing is MDS is a diagnosis of exclusion. And as I mentioned again, is that MDS like features, they are reactive or clonal. And then other point is, is that dysplasia in more than 10% of the cells or is that borderline dysplasia? Because even normal people, they can have cytopenia and dysplasia in excess of a little bit at the borderline of 10%. And again, they are normal, not MDS. So when we have this definition, more than 10% of the dysplasia, so once we have decided that there is dysplasia going on in more than 10% of the cells, so then what actually constitute the dysplasia? What exactly is the definition of dysplasia? So for that, we are looking at different lineages. So this main abnormal. So now we are looking at whether there is dyserythropoiesis, dysmyelopoiesis, or dysmacacaryopoiesis. So when we say dyserythropoiesis, so that means there are changes in the nuclei as well as the cytoplasm. So for the nuclei, there are some changes, for example, budding, fragmentation, bridging, multinucleation, vocalization. And in the aspirate, now we start seeing ring citroplast. So these are all features of some dyserythropoiesis going on in the marrow. For the myelopoiesis, we can see a neutrophilic change in the peripheral blood film as well as in the marrow. So now we are looking at either there are different uh, shapes or sizes. And for the cytoplasm, we are looking at either there's a hypogranularity or there is a hypergranularity which look like a, like a dolly body or shooter gashi syndrome. And for the hyposegmentation, now cells, they have algal hue anomalies, or sometimes they can be hypersegmented. And for the megakaryopoiesis, micromegakaryocytes with the multinucleation are monolobated or hypolobated and micromegakaryocytes. This is quite specific clue for the diagnosis of MDS. So let's focus on uh, different type of cells. So first, RBCs, red blood cells. Normal red blood cells, they have MCV 80 to 100 femtoliter. Anything less than 80 is microcyte, and more than 100 is macrocyte. Normal RBC, they have diameter of six to eight micrometer, and they look exactly 
uh, to that of mature lymphocyte. So when obviously there is this erythropoiesis going on in the marrow, so we start seeing two different type of populations. So one is normal, one is abnormal. So that's going to reflect in bone marrow as a dysrethropoiesis and in the peripheral blood film as dimorphic picture. So some of the cells, they are normocytes and some of the cells, they are macrocytes. So they will have normocytic hypochromic picture or normocytic normochromic picture or macrocytic normochromic picture. And some of the cells, they can be microcytes. And in the cytoplasm, there will be basophilic stippling. And if those cells, they are macro, they can be round macrocytes or avello macrocytes. And some other changes we can see in the RBCs. And especially if there is dysrethropoiesis in the marrow, they, uh, in the blood film, we can see some megaloblastoid nucleated RBCs circulating in the blood. And again, if there is a dysrethropoiesis in the marrow, that is going to reflect into the peripheral blood film as pseudo reticulocytosis. So cells, they are having more polychromasia. So mean there are polychromatic cells, they'll be increased. So these are, uh, you can see here, some of the cells, they are round and big. So that is round microcytosis. And some of the cells, they are of normal size. So some are like normal size, some are, uh, sorry, macrocytes. So this is a dimorphic picture with the polychromatic cells and two different type of uh, RBCs. So on this side, you can see there is basophilic stippling going on. This one is target cell. This is Howell Jolly body. And all of these cells, they are big. So these are round macrocytes. So these are all big signs of some kind of dysrethropoiesis in the marrow. For the WBCs, we are looking at neutrophils as well as monocytes. So neutrophils, they can have some abnormalities in the nuclei as well as in the cytoplasm. So when we say dysplastic neutrophils, so they can have different shapes and different sizes. They can have abnormal nuclear lobations and uh, abnormal granularity and absent or reduced granularity. So for the granulocyte uh, nuclei, either there will be reduced segmentation, so they have pseudo palgar hue abnormally, or sometimes they can be hypersegmented. And other changes we can see in nuclei, they are having ring-shaped nuclei or some nuclear sticks. And for the cytoplasm, now they can have sometimes pseudo radic hagashi type of anomaly. Or for the nuclei, we also can see lengthening and thinning. For the monocytes, monocytes, instead of looking mature, now they start looking immature and they can have abnormalities of nuclear lobation. So these are the granulocytic uh, cells, which are dysplastic now. So these are the diagnostic picture of dysplastic neutrophils. So here you can see this is a very tiny neutrophil, one clumped uh, nuclei, which is a bit indented, and cytoplasm is hypogranular. These are also showing clumped nuclei. That's a clumped nuclei, and cytoplasm is hypogranular. This is granules, they are kind of clumped at one side and nuclei is clumped and irregular. This one is showing ring shaped nuclei along with the clumping of the granules. And this is also almost a ring shaped nuclei with hypogranular cytoplasm. And this one is palgar hue with the hypogranular cytoplasm. So all these are, they are reflecting dysplastic neutrophils. So on the other hand side, we can see hypersegmented neutrophils. So now this nuclei is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, almost eight to nine lobes. So these are hypersegmented neutrophils. So if we see six lobes or 3% of the neutrophils with at least five lobes, so these are hypersegmented one. For the platelets, usually platelets in peripheral blood film, they are normal, but sometimes they can be hypogranular and very rarely hypergranular. And megakaryocytic fragments we only don't see in the blood. Now coming to the bone marrow aspirate and bone marrow biopsy. So first row in the aspirate, we see cellularity. And majority of the MDS cases, they are hypercellular. And very rarely they can be hyperplastic 
and uh, then differential diagnosis is a plastic anemia. So when we are evaluating for the dysplasia, we need to count at least 500 cells in each line. And then we decide based on that whether there's dysplasia seen in more than 10% of the cells. And next question is which lineage is involved. And the next thing we need to look for is the blast. So less than 5% of the blast in bone marrow, they are normal. So now we are looking at anything more than 5%, but less than 19%. And if there is cytopenia, pancytopenia, along with lesion 5Q, then we don't need to have dysplasia because this is already a category in WHO classification. So the diagnosis of MDS can be rendered without the need of identifying dysplasia. Next one, we are looking uh, for megakaryocytes. Look at least for 30 megakaryocytes before deciding whether they are dysplastic or not. So now after the dysplasia, what else do we need? So we need in the aspirate iron stain, Persian blue stain. This is for the grading of iron in the marrow. And now we are also looking for the ring cytoplast. So for the ring cytoplast, this is iron that accumulates in the mitochondria of erythroid precursors. This is forming a kind of ring around the nuclei. So at least one third of the circumference that is covered by the iron granules. So minimum we need five citrotic granules that is covering at least one third of the circumference. So that is the definition of ring citroblast. For megakaryocytes, again, if megakaryocytes, they are approximately two cells per high power field, that is considered as within normal range. And again, marrow, they can have less than 10% of the megakaryocytes, which are micro megakaryocytes. So now we are looking at again, more than 10% of the micro megakaryocytes. And if they are there, that is quite specific for the diagnosis of myelodysplasia, especially separated circular nuclei in a large megakaryocyte or non-segmental or hypolobated uh, megakaryocyte in a small, uh, of small size, that's quite characteristic of MDS. And again, what's the definition of micro megakaryocytes? So normal average diameter is about 50 to 100 micrometer uh, of the normal megakaryocyte. So when we are saying micro, so that means now we are looking at anything less than 13, 30, 30 micrometer, or sometimes they can be very small, just seven to 15 micron meter. This is almost the size of RBC. So that's the definition of micro megakaryocytes. Once we see that, that's quite specific uh, diagnostic view for the diagnosis of MDS. And it has a very high reproducibility. So these are different pictures of dysplastic megakaryocytes. So you can see here, this one is a very tiny one with two separate lobes and all these are monorobated and small. So these are all micro megakaryocytes. These are also again, hypolobated and micro megakaryocytes. This one is just bare nuclei and this one is almost nuclei is pushed to the side and the cytoplasm is almost empty. So this case actually was deletion 5Q with small micro megakaryocytes. We can also use immunohistochemistry in MDS. For the immunohistochemistry, we can use these ancillary tests. For the blast count, we can use CD34. For megakaryocytes, we can have CD61, CD42B, and CD41. But Actually, when we don't have all these markers available, we can use PES, which is a very nice stain to highlight megakaryocytes. And especially if PES is positive in the erythroblast, that's quite characteristic of erythroleukemia. Other markers we can use in erythroid series are hemoglobin, glycophorin, GLUT1, or transferrin receptor factor 1. We can also use P53, which is a classical tumor suppressor gene, and nuclear expression is quite correlated with uh, poor prognosis. And uh, main important question is, this should be interpreted very carefully because this is not specific to MDS only. What else do we need for the diagnosis of MDS? So we need reticulin stain to look for the fibrosis and other stromal changes. If there is increased fibrosis, that might be indicating MPN slash MDS spectrum. And additionally, we need flow cytometry for the blast count and for the avatar sequence. 
And additionally, obviously, we need cytogenetics and molecular studies. In bone marrow biopsy, sometimes we see this ALIP. So ALIP is abnormal localization of immature precursors. So under the normal circumstances, immature precursors, they are lying around these bony trabeculates, and then they migrate into the center for the maturation. So if there is dysplasia going on, so instead of those immature precursors along the bony trabeculate, now they already are in the center. So now that's why the word is ALIP, abnormal localization of immature precursors. And especially if we start seeing anything more than three to five clusters, cells forming clusters, that is abnormal. And that's one of the strongest clue for the MDS rather than secondary causes of dysplasia. But there are some differential diagnoses of ALIP, especially if there is any erythroblastic hyperplasia going on, especially megaloblastoids. They can look like ALIP or any after post granulocyte Conley stimulating factor, if there is any granulocytic proliferation, that can also look like ALIP or some benign or any lymphoproliferative lymphoid aggregates. So we need to rule out all other secondary causes of ALIP and uh, This is a very nice representation of these dysplastic lineages, see this paper. So for the erythroid lineage, we can see erythroid hyperplasia, megaloblastoid changes, multinuclearity or hyper uh, sieve-like nuclei with uh, big nucleoli. This is more like a megaloblastoid and we can also see nuclear pycnosis. And uh, we can also see nuclear lobation, cytoplasmic fraying. These are the citroblast, but this one is ring citroblast. So this is almost forming a complete ring around the nuclei. So that's why the name is the ring citroblast. For the megakaryocytes, we can see micro megakaryocytes. So this one is hypolobated as well as small in size. This one is more looking like an osteoclastic giant cell rather than a micro or megakaryocytes. So all you can see here is these nuclei, they are separate and uh, it's a multinucleated cell basically. And this one is binucleated with two lobes and those are having separate lobes actually. This one is monolobated and uh, small megakaryocyte. For the granulocytic series, we can see palgar hue, we can see abnormal nuclear shapes, we can see hypo or uh, absent granularity, and then obviously we can look for, uh, we need to look for myeloblast. For the cytogenetic abnormalities, we can use fish studies and color-coded chromosomal studies. Deletion 5Q is the only one which is specific to the MDS and it has a good prognosis. Other findings, they are not specific and they are not used to define the MDS, but they are strongly correlated with the prognosis. Especially prognosis is based upon this revised international prognostic scoring system, which is IPSSR. So we need to have cytogenetic abnormalities. We need to know whether there is cytogenetics abnormal or normal. For the diagnosis of MDS, do we need to have flow cytometry? As I mentioned, no, it's not a specific tool for the diagnosis of MDS, but there is this GATA scoring, which is uh, sensitive and specific in low risk MDS. And this scoring system is based upon these four cardinal parameters. So first one is the percentage of CD34 myeloid progenitor cells. Second one we need to look for is the B cells precursors within CD34 positive compartment. And then we are looking at CD45 expression on myeloid progenitor relative to that on lymphocyte. And fourth one is we are looking at side scattered properties of neutrophils in comparison with lymphocytes. So based on this, we have scoring system. So if score is only zero to one, this is considered as negative and we don't need any further workup for the MDS. But if the scoring is two or more, this is positive now. So obviously need to do further workup. So VATA score is a simple, reproducible and robust for the diagnosis of MDS. 
but is only helpful when it is used in conjunction with the clinical information and along with bone and uh, blood film uh, findings. So this is a nice paper if you want to read about flow cytometry and uh, OVATA scoring. There are some differential diagnosis of high-risk MDS. So one is hypoplastic MDS. So in approximately 10% of MDS cases, cellularity is quite low for the patient's age. And um, then the differential diagnosis is obviously aplastic anemia. So hypoplastic MDS is usually seen in female and usually they have single lineal dysplasia. So when we are defining it from the aplastic anemia, so in aplastic anemia, we see there is decline of three hematopoietic lineages and especially megakaryocytic lineage is quite pronounced. But if there is a hypoplastic MDS, megakaryocytes, they are frequently concerned, but it's obviously a very challenging diagnosis. And in hypoplastic MDS, obviously we are looking for a blast and then we can use CD34 IHC staining. But in real life, this diagnosis is a very challenging one. Then we can have MDS with the fibrosis. Again, this one is a sign of poor prognosis. So anything with the fibrosis, now we are looking at whether this is MDS or this is MDS slash MPN spectrum. And we need to rule out any secondary causes of fibrosis any underlying tumors, therapy-related MDS, chronic infections, autoimmune diseases, and as I mentioned, myeloproliferative syndromes. Sometimes approximately 50% of the cases, they can have a thread proliferation, and that proliferation can exceed more than 50% of the nucleated cells. So in 2008, all those cases which had myeloblast to non erythroblastic cell proliferation, more than 20%, they were classified as erythroleukemia. But now this blast percentage is counted differently in WHO classification of uh, 2016. So now all those cases which were previously diagnosed as erythroleukemia, now they are classified as MDS-EB. And these patients, they have poor prognosis, and mostly these cases, they might have underlying TP53 gene mutation, and they are high-risk patients. So now coming to the cases. Case number one, this patient is 45-year female. She had chronic anemia. All other parameters, they were within normal range. So first of all, we can see from this picture there is pancytopenia. I'm seeing only one neutrophil here. And this picture is quite dimorphic. There is increased polychromasia. And few of the cells, they are like uh, round macrocytes. Few of the cells, they are hypochromic. Few of the cells, they are small. So very dimorphic picture is going on. And other thing, along with the pancytopenia, I'm seeing this dysplastic neutrophil. So this is palgar hue neutrophil. So now this patient has macrocytosis and dysplastic neutrophils. So obviously from this picture, we can say there are at least two abnormalities going on. So this patient was MDS, multilineal dysplasia. This is 65-year-old female. She had chronic thrombocytopenia. So for the age match cellularity, cellularity is not that much increased. So I'm not seeing any other abnormalities here. I'm not seeing any clustering here. There are no obvious plasts. Only abnormality I can see here is this megakaryocyte, which is a bit small and it has monolobated nuclei. So this is hypolobated micro megakaryocyte. So based upon this, this was the only abnormality this patient had. So now the diagnosis is MDS, single lineage dysplasia. This guy, he is 82 year old with chronic monocytosis and had uh, anemia and mild lymphocytosis. So in the blood film, you can see RBCs, they are of normal shape and size. I'm not seeing any significant anisocytosis or poiglocytosis. There is no nucleated RBC either. And leukocyte count is a bit increased, but there is this mixture of these cells. So now I can see there are two monocytes, two lymphocytes, and two neutrophils. So monocytes, they are of normal shape. There is speculated cytoplasm and uh, 
nuclei. This one is bit immature. I can see a small nuclei here. And uh, for the lymphocytes, they are of mature morphology. For the neutrophils, I can see there is like a lengthening of the nuclear shape. And there is clumping of this, uh, these granules. So these are abnormal. So these are both abnormal neutrophils. So now we can see, first of all, RBCs, they are of normal shape and size. There is a bit of minocytosis and mature lymphocytes and it is plastic neutrophils. So on the bone marrow, he is 82. So for the 82 year of age, this bone marrow is almost packed. So from this power, I can say packed marrow with one big lymphoid aggregate. And this lymphoid aggregate is almost infiltrating into the bone marrow space, fat spaces. And they, this is composed of mature lymphoid cells. And other abnormality I can see other than uh, hypercellular marrow, these megakaryocytes. So these megakaryocytes, they are small, pycnotic. This one is like bare nuclei here. This one is small with single nuclei here. This is again small and single nuclei. This is a bit of a irregular but single nuclei and small size. So these megakaryocytes, they are not forming any clusters. And they are separate, they are small. And uh, so from this marrow, I can say there is there are a few things going on. First, this is hypercellular marrow. Then we have abnormal megakaryocytes. And then we have granulocytic hyperplasia in the background. And then there is this lymphoid aggregate, which was positive for CD20. And with the reticulum stain, at least grade one fibrosis was going on. So based on the stacking all together, cellularity and dysplasia and lymphoid aggregates, this was a complex diagnosis. So the diagnosis of MDS slash MPA and chronic lymphocytic leukemia was rendered. So it was quite a challenging case. So to summarize all the findings, so for the diagnosis of MDS, we need to have clinical history. We need to have type and duration of symptoms. What type of cytopenia patient is having? Is that a single type of cytopenia or pancytopenia? And in the peripheral blood film, we are looking at the cytopenia, dysplasia, and blast. And for bone marrow aspirate, again, we are looking at cellularity, dysplasia, and blast. And for the aspirate, again, we are looking at the ring citroblast. And then we need to decide whether those ring citroblasts, they are 5% or 15%. And for the bone marrow biopsy, again, cellularity, dysplasia, blast, and fibrosis. Flow cytometry, we need for the flow, uh, for the blast count and for the Avada scoring. And for the molecular and cytogenetic studies, it's not a specific one for the MDS. And actually, 70% of the patients, they can have normal karyotype, but it's again very helpful for the prognosis. So these are the practical take-home points. Diagnosis of MDS is a very complex and challenging one because cytopenia and dysplasia is not exclusive to MDS only. And the most uh, challenging things that include are cytopenia with clonal hematopoiesis, which are not fulfilling the criteria of MDS. And if there is cytopenia and dysplasia along with the germline mutations, or if there is a family history suggesting an underlying gene defects, and MDS based upon a recurrent chromosomal abnormalities and overt MDS with diagnostic difficulties due to concurrent disease or any treatment. And MDS morphological feature can be obscured by concurrent diseases or treatment effects on the bone marrow. So these are quite challenging cases. And uh, I highly recommend this paper. This is an excellent paper, really, really excellent paper. So all those cases and all those challenges, they are actually discussed in this paper. So it's a must read. So for all those diagnoses, we might need to have a repeat sampling to establish the diagnosis of uh, MDS. So that is the end of my PowerPoint. If you have any questions, that's my email. I'll be really happy to answer those. Thank you so much. Stay safe. And thank you so much, Dr. Limsi Gupta. Thank you. <laughs>